sun is new each day. It is amazing what a shadow can tell someone with an inquiring mind. Once, in Rome and Egypt, there was a man who with sticks, shadows, and a very deep well was able to determine the size of the earth. That, however, is a story for a later time. Before that, there were cultures and civilizations around the globe that learned to tell time by measuring the length of a shadow, and by doing so, figured out how long a year was. In places as far flung as Borneo, Peru, Babylonia, and Ireland, ancient astronomers first raised sticks, then poles, and then monuments, and finally, entire temples with the aim of understanding just how the sun moved in the daytime sky. And while some of these artifacts date back centuries and millennia, no civilization approaches the length of the Chinese dedication to record keeping and observation. Dating back to Oroco bones from the Bronze Age Shang Dynasty, decorated with the pictorial ideogram of a hand grasping a pole topped by a shining disc, the various kingdoms, feudal duchies, and empires of China have made it a habit of watching and understanding the sun. Beginning in the 7th century BCE in the Shao Dynasty, we have an 1800 year unbroken record of solar observations made by something called a gnomon. A gnomon is nothing more than a vertical object placed in an open space so that it casts a shadow when the sun shines. However, if a culture makes understanding what the sun does a priority, as all the great and lasting ones do, this tool can be used to great effect to understand the course of the yearly cycles of the sun. During the time of the Eastern Han Dynasty, roughly equivalent to the period of the rise of the Roman Empire and through the five good emperors there, a town called Yangsheng was thought to be the center of the world. In it stood an eight-foot-tall stone gnomon where observations were made for 1,500 years. By 725 CE, that instrument anchored a series of gnomon stations that spanned a north-south line, called a meridian on the Earth, of over 3,500 kilometers from Siberia to modern Indochina. And in 1279 CE, in that same city, a great observatory, more than 40 feet in height, was constructed to serve in part as a giant gnomon with a measuring scale stretched out due north on the ground some 120 feet in order to measure with great precision the length of the shadow cast by the structure at noon. So precise were the Chinese measurements that they were able to establish the true length of a year within an error of just a minute or so. In this episode of the Scientific Odyssey, we'll see if we can understand how such measurements might be made and what we can deduce from them. Hello and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place. Episode 3, Sun Cycles. The joy of life comes from our encounters with new experiences, and hence, there is no greater joy than to have an endlessly changing horizon, for each day to have a new and different sun. Christopher McCandless When you had arrived at Southampton, you had finished your last long journey for a while. The ship's navigator had contacted some people and made arrangements. He put in a good word, and the next thing you knew, you were at school. Not university, of course. That was reserved for those soon to be men of the cloth, usually from very wealthy families. No, you were at the Leuven School, run by the Merchants Guild in Antwerp, to which you had traveled and had been enrolled for just over 18 months. In that time, you had begun to learn the steer course by map and heavens. You had mastered the sextant and compass, 
and if all went well over the next few months, you'd rejoin your crew as an apprentice in the service of your patron. He was from an old Sicilian family, and had split the cost of your education. In return, you'd work first under him, and then, once you'd proved your skill, for him. The arrangement wasn't as potentially lucrative as being an independent navigator could be, especially if you were really good, but it was a whole lot more secure, and you wouldn't have to find your own jobs. As you ate a late summer apple, tart and crisp in the cooling weather, you found yourself watching the sun's descent toward the horizon. Today was a bit of a special day, as it would set due west on the horizon, something it did only twice a year. When you stepped off the boat nearly two Januaries ago, you had no idea that the path of the sun through the sky was so complicated. Now, you think about it every day. Measuring the passage of the sun was something you learned in stages from short and simple to long and complex. The easiest thing to learn was using the gnomon, the heart of any sundial. A gnomon was simply a post placed vertically on the ground in an open space so that it will cast a shadow when the sun is up. The shadow, like all shadows do, pointed in the exact opposite direction of the sun. If the sun was low, the shadow would be long, and if high, the shadow would be short. One of the first things your teacher had you do was get up early and go to the abbey at the edge of town next to the old fortress. Your task was to set up a gnomon and mark the end of the shadow from sunrise to sunset on a day in March. Before dawn, there were the few steps to complete. First, you used a plumb bob to ensure that the gnomon was perfectly vertical. Next, using a tool dating all the way back to the Romans, you sighted Polaris and marked out due north from the post, and from that, east and west. Once finished, you awaited for the first rays of the sunlight to pierce the morning sky, already brightening towards dawn. As the sun began low in the eastern horizon, the shadow was long and pointed west. Due west, actually. From your markings, you could see the limb of the sun just poking above the low hills at the point you had marked as due east. As the sun rose and began to trace its daily path through the southern sky, the shadow moved from due west towards northwest and then to the north as the morning wore on. Throughout this time, you studied the maps that made up part of your instruction and the shadow grew shorter until it was just a bit longer than the height of the gnomon itself. From the experience you had determining the position of the North Star and the mark you had made earlier that morning, you knew that the shadow was pointed straight at the place on the horizon that would have been directly below Polaris, if it could have been seen. At that moment, the sun was due south, and the monks in the Kaiserberg Abbey, whose courtyard you were using, began the prayers for sext the sixth hour. Early in the morning, you had already listened to them chant prime and terse, their voices filling the chill air with melody and harmony. Even as they finished their prayers and went to lunch, you saw that the shadow had now moved towards the east a bit and began to grow longer. Every half an hour or so, you marked the end of the shadow until the sun had set in the west, projecting a long, easterly shadow before it went behind the low hills. As dust settled in, you drew a picture of your shadow's dotted path on the ground in your folio book, a negative record of the sun's path through the sky on that day. You saw that from the markings, you could construct the rough face of a sundial, with the first hour on the left if you face north, third hour being halfway to the middle, noon being at the shortest point, ninth hour, also known as third hour post-meridian, halfway to the right, and then fifth hour being almost all the way to the left. In this way, you could have measured out 12 hours as half a day, with night being the other half. You remember being enormously pleased to have made such an orderly thing while the Dominican monks of the Abbey had marked the passage of time with their chanted prayers. You smile now as you remember your naive pride on that day 18 months ago. It was not that you were wrong in it, it's just that there was so much you didn't know. When you were sent out a week later to repeat the activity in the same courtyard with the same gnomon, you had thought the exercise to be a waste of your time as you stood cold in the slowly brightening dawn. The sun rose in the east, 
traveled through the southern sky and set in the west. You had shown it. And so, as the monks began to chant lauds, you couldn't have been more surprised to see the shadow stretch out a bit south of your last mark at sunrise. This meant that the sun was rising on the northern side of east, maybe by about four degrees. As you tracked the shadow, you realized that it was a bit shorter than it had been a week earlier as well. A trend confirmed when you saw the shadow pointing due north. It was not as long as it had been, indicating that the sun was now higher in the sky. Over the course of the rest of the day, it tracked to the west, but when the Vespers chant began, the sun was setting north of due east. As the light faded, you made the appropriate notes and realized your perfect timekeeping system was more complicated than you thought. The sun had traveled a further distance in the sky, which meant if the sky turned uniformly, the day had been longer and the night had been shorter. Over the course of the next three months, from bright week through Pentecost to midsummer night, you made the nearly weekly trip to the abbey's courtyard and observed the sun and the shadow cast by the gnomon, recording each time the shadow's path in your notebook. In that time, you learned some of the prayers of the brothers, shared lunch with the abbot, and saw that each day the sun rose further north of east, traveled higher in the southern sky, and then set further north of west. At first, the shift of the sun's rising and setting position was large, but as midsummer night approached, the shift grew smaller and smaller until, for a time, it seemed that the sun's rising position stood still on the horizon. The days were long now, with dawn coming far too early for your liking and the dusk lingering late into the night, and the darkness seemed almost too short for the world to get enough sleep. The farmers, though, made good use of the long days and fair weather. However, after the midsummer festival, you began to notice the sun's rising and setting begin to shift back southwards towards due east, just a bit each day. Along with that, the gnomon's shadow at noon grew longer and longer. The days were beginning to shorten now, imperceptibly at first, but as July turned into August, one Caesar becoming the other, you realized you could tell the difference. At this point, you were marking the rising and setting of the sun by landmarks on the horizon, and you could measure the difference, using your fingers at first, and then the practice sextant you were given by the school. In September, you made measurements that showed that the sun rose due east and set due west once again. At noon, the gnomon's shadow was the same length as it had been on that first day, and once again, the day and the night were equal. This time, though, you had a good sense of what you'd find in a week's time. The sun would rise south of east, and the gnomon's shadow would be longer at noon. The sun would rise later and not reach the altitude it had the week before. Finally, it would set south of west, and the day would be shorter than the night. When you went to the courtyard to confirm your predictions, you spoke with the abbot about what you had learned. Having provided a space for students for the school for a number of years, he nodded in affirmation of your predictions. He told you that as the Feast of Michael Mass passed, and All Souls Day approached, the daytime services grew closer together, and the time the brothers would sleep between vigil and lauds was longer. As the Benedictines worked their way through the liturgical calendar, you followed the motions of the sun. During Advent, as Christmas approached, the motion of the sun's rising position on the horizon again slowed and seemed to come to a stop in the southeast. As the days grew short and cold, the monks were kind enough to share their sour ale and warm soup to keep the chill from your bones. You repaid their kindness by helping them establish and keep true noon each week. However, as Epiphany passed and you moved to Lent, the storms off the North Sea made it harder to travel and your visits became more sporadic. Food was in short supply as well, as the fall fruits ran out and what meat remained was rationed. For those cold months, you lived on porridges of grain and tubers, but when you could get to Kaiserberg, the beer was always good. However, as bad as the food was at times, you had hope that it would come to an end. As you tracked the sun, you could see that it was rising closer to east again, traveling back north on the horizon. Again, the movement was very slow through January, but it picked up through the Lenten months 
beginning at Candlemas and continuing through early March. As Easter approached, the great days grew perceptibly longer, until, almost on the day of the great festival that ended the fast of Lent, the day and night were once again equal in length. The cycle had been completed, equinox to equinox. And as you finished your first year, you acquired both the fundamental knowledge of the sun and its motions to use to navigate during the day. Some painters transform the sun into a yellow spot. Others transform a yellow spot into the sun. Pablo Picasso. During your year of tracking the sun, you learned a host of other skills. Chief among them was how to use the compass and sextant to make measurements, how to use the wind to approximate how fast and how far you've traveled, and plot a course using a map. Even as you learn the practical tools, you continued to study the night sky. You learned the names of the constellations taken in the northern hemisphere from the tradition of the Greeks. There were about 45 you were taught to recognize. Some, those that were close enough to Polaris that they never set, were called circumpolar. More important, you were told, were the 12 constellations of the zodiac. You had heard of them from the astrologers and soothsayers that seemed to inhabit every market and square you had visited while under sail. They had promised to cast your fortune and tell you the future, but you hadn't put much stock in their prognostications. You hadn't ever met a landbound soul who could predict the mood of the sea as well as someone who read the signs of the clouds and the waves. Still, though, you learned that the zodiac was important beyond the foolery of the mystics. It was the band in the sky through which the moon, sun, and planets moved. On the voyage to Britain, you had observed the moon's motion through the belt of twelve constellations, known from ancient times. Over the last six months, though, following your initial investigations of the sun, you had focused on learning about the daybringer's motion through the belt as well. On your voyage, you had seen that one month the sky had slid to the east. A constellation that had been rising just as the sun set was now 30 degrees above the horizon, and the constellation to its west was rising. Your instructors, though, had showed that it was not actually the sky slipping, but the sun moving. Just as the moon moved west to east against the background stars 13 degrees each full day and night, the sun moved just about one degree in the same amount of time. On the day of the vernal equinox in March, when the sun rose directly to the east and set directly in the west, the sun was in the constellation of Pisces. You couldn't see that, of course, but you knew it had to be the case, because just as the sun was setting, the zodiacal constellation, six places away in the belt, Virgo, was rising in the sky. Six months later, on the autumnal equinox, the sun would be in Virgo, and you would see Pisces rising. The sun would travel 360 degrees around the zodiac, in 365 days. Your teacher had told you this was why the ancient Babylonians had divided the circle into 360 even intervals, as it was close to the solar year. What made this even harder to learn, though, but also more interesting, was that the path of the sun wasn't actually level. To understand this, your teachers had taught you to think of the earth as a sphere, something almost every sailor already knew. As a sphere, the Earth had a northernmost point, the North Pole, a southernmost point, the South Pole, and the equator that went around the Earth midway between the two, east to west. Parallel to these were lines of latitude that also ran to east to west that were either north or south of the equator. Perpendicular to the equator, running north to south through the poles, were lines of longitude. As a navigator, it was easy to determine your latitude by measuring the height of Polaris. Longitude, though, was a great deal harder to ascertain. What your instructors had taught you 
was that you could think of the sky in the same way, as a great celestial globe or sphere. Polaris marked the North Celestial Pole. Like on the Earth, 90 degrees from that was the celestial equator. Now one might think that the zodiacal constellations ran along the celestial equator, but they didn't. You learned that the belt of the zodiac was tilted, as was the sun's path through that belt. The sun's actual path through the zodiac was called the ecliptic because that's where all the eclipses took place. This path was tilted at an angle of about 23 degrees to the celestial equator and intersected it at two points. At first, you had a hard time visualizing this tilted path until you thought of a ship sailing from the Portuguese colonies in South America back to the home country. On the globe of the Earth, a ship could travel in a straight line on the globe from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere going west to east, and then in doing so, it would have to cross the equator somewhere out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. That's what the sun was doing on the celestial sphere. Before the vernal equinox in March, the sun was in the celestial sphere's southern hemisphere. As it traveled east on the sphere one degree per day, on its tilted path, it would eventually cross into the northern hemisphere. The day when the sun was on the celestial equator was the vernal equinox, and so the sun followed the celestial equator's path as it rose and set, spending exactly half of its time above the horizon and half of its time below the horizon. The time was equal day and equal night, or in Latin, equinox. Every day after that, the sun would be further above the celestial equator and would rise north of east and spend more time above the horizon, at least until June. At some point, since the path had to make a circle, it would curve back down towards the celestial equator to meet it again at the point exactly halfway around the celestial sphere. The period when the height of the sun moving on the ecliptic above the celestial equator increased was the three months from March to June. The highest point was called the summer solstice, named for the observation that the rising point of the sun seemed to sit still for about a month before reversing direction. From June to September, the sun would move closer to the celestial equator and the days would grow shorter. At the crossing point, called the autumnal equinox, the day and night were the same length, and then until December they would continue to get shorter as the sun was further below the celestial equator more each passing day. In December was the winter solstice where the sun was furthest below the celestial equator and spent the least time above the horizon. From then until March the days grew longer though they remained shorter than the nights until, once again, the sun was at the vernal equinox. This picture that you had been taught of the sun following a path across the celestial sphere explained the observations you had made in the courtyard of the abbey. In the main hall of the Leuven school was a model of all of this. Fashioned in bronze and brass, the armillary sphere showed the globe of the earth nested within the framework of the celestial sphere with its equator and ecliptic paths fashioned from bands of metal. On the ecliptic were inscribed the names of the zodiacal constellations to remind the student of the position of the sun in each month. It was a masterpiece of functional beauty, both a work of art and a tool for understanding the heavens. As you finished your apple, you mused over how much you had learned in the last 18 months. It hadn't been easy. You had had to think about it each day and the model spheres your instructors showed you helped tremendously. You knew there was more to learn, though. Just like latitude and longitude on Earth, there was a coordinate system on the celestial sphere, something called right ascension and declination. A star's coordinates in that system didn't change like they did with azimuth and altitude, but you were told it was harder to learn and to use. There was also the motion of the other planets to learn, something you knew was very complicated. Still, though, you had a good foundation, and you knew how to use the tools. As you watched the sun set, you knew it wouldn't be too long before you were back at sea.
This is Ran from CM Pod, a podcast for curious minds about science, technology, and history. Every week, a new episode. Your Boat's Technology, the history of LSD, genetics, poisons. Here's a taste of one of our latest episodes on the Black Death. Those who could afford it fled to secluded castles and isolated farms. The poor people in the cities had nowhere to go. Monks died, just like everyone else. Priests died, just like everyone else. A young French physician named Alexandre Yersin was sent to Hong Kong by the Pasteur Institute to do his own research. Visit our website and check out our episode backlog, cmpod.net. Search for CMPod, one word, no spaces, on iTunes and the Android Play Store. If you've got a curious mind, you're one of us. CMPod.net. Tell me the story about how the sun loved the moon so much that she died every night just to let him breathe. Hanako Ishii Telling time with the sun is a lot harder than you might think at first. Sure, you can count the passage of days, but that's not exactly telling time. As my colleague Frank Daniels says, one way to understand time is it is humans' attempt to track cycles of repeating events. That's why tracking time with the moon was easier in a lot of ways. The cycle of phases was obvious for all to see, and it happened quickly enough that observers could catch on pretty quickly. Sunrise to sunrise is a cycle too, but it's hard to break into smaller divisions. A month can be broken into days, especially if the full sunrise-to-sunrise cycle seems to take about the same amount of time, which is something you can determine from the motion of stars in the heavens. But what do you break the days into? Of course, you think now, hours, minutes, and seconds. But if you consider it, those had to be invented. And so what was done before that? I think one can easily imagine breaking daytime into four parts and nighttime into another four parts. The day could first be broken into halves, something preserved in the AM-PM division. And then those halves could be broken into halves again. The religious tradition of Christianity does this in its divine office or liturgy of hours, with prayers being offered in those communities devoted to the practice at sunrise, a quarter of the way through the day, halfway, and three quarters of the way, known as prime, terse, sect, and non, respectively. The night hours include Vespers, Compline, Matins, or Nocturne, as it's sometimes called, and finally, Lods. This ordering of the day preserves an even more ancient Hebrew tradition that may stretch back even further than that. It's not until the Babylonians and their heirs, the Greeks, that the two 12-hour division system would become more common. The easier cycle to measure is that of a yearly cycle. This is where the gnomon's true power becomes evident. As explained in our story of the Apprentice Navigator, it is by measuring the shadow cast by the vertical rod or pole that we can begin to see changes in the sun's motion through the daytime sky. The most important piece of this is to make observations each day of the shadow's length at noon, when the sun is due south. In carefully noting that length, an astronomer in the northern hemisphere can see the shadow get shorter from December through June as each day the sun gets higher. After this, the shadow grows longer at noon until it returns to its December length. In this way, one can actually measure how long a year is. As with all measuring technologies, the gnomon will undergo a series of refinements in order to enable the user to increase the precision of the measurements made. The problem is that measuring the length of a shadow can be tricky. A short gnomon makes for a short shadow, thereby increasing the relative size of any error. Another issue is that the end of the shadow is never as sharp-edged as an observer would like. Finally, 
early gnomons lacked a good scale with which to measure the shadow's length. As such, the ability to measure the specific day on which the shadow is the same length as it was the year previously was a difficult thing to do. At first, many cultures may have thought that the solar year was about the same as the 12-month lunar cycle, that 354-day time. However, as data accumulated over several cycles, it would have become clear that this wasn't the case. Over time, the length of the year would have been increased with it reaching about 360 in many cultures. As we will see in a number of upcoming supplemental episodes, this number was very attractive as a solar year length for a variety of reasons, and many lunisolar calendars would stick on this idea even as data came to light that showed that 360 days was still too short. As gnomons became larger and techniques such as attaching a pennant or a banner to the top of the gnomon came into use, the ability to make more precise determinations of length of the shadow led to more accurate measurements. In cultures that did this, the length of the year was established to be 365 days before too long. To become more accurate than that, a civilization either had to take and record data for decades or more, had to have built truly monumental gnomons with dedicated measuring devices on the ground to document the length of the shadow, or both, as was the case with the Chinese. Both advances required civilizations to be wealthy, stable, and have the ability to keep records. Hence, only a few were able to arrive at a yearly length of 365.25 days, and as far as I've been able to research, only the Maya and Chinese were able to approach the number we know it to be now, which is 365.2422 days. That's the actual length of the solar year. By the 5th century CE, the Chinese were within one minute of this year, as opposed to the Julian calendar used in the West for about 15 centuries that ran 11 minutes slow. By the way, 11 minutes a year may not seem like much, but over the course of 125 years, it adds up to a day, and in 15 centuries, the calendar would have slipped by about 12 days compared to the sky, quite a lot when working with planting and harvesting seasons. The easiest way to understand this as a problem is to think of the Egyptian idea of the rising of Sirius marking the beginning of the Nile flood season. If the Egyptian rulers set that date by having an astronomer make observations, then they'll always be fine. However, if they measure it once, and let's say it's on June 1st, and then they tell the people that June 1st is always going to be the day, that's when they're going to run into trouble. Since an actual year, let's say, runs faster than the calendar, it will eventually get ahead not by a day or two, but by a week or more. When this happens, the Nile flood will occur before the planters have had time to get their seeds in the ground, and so the harvest will be bad. If this happens too often, the rulers won't be rulers for too much longer. By the time of our navigator in the story, this is exactly the problem in Europe, and it compounded a number of other issues to create permanent famine and conditions. This would lead to a calendar reform movement led by the Catholic Church in the 16th century that will have very important consequences, but we'll tell that story when we get there. Wake, for the sun who scattered into flight, the stars before him from the field of night, drives night along with them from heaven, and strikes the sultan's turret with a shaft of light. Omar Khayyam While the months divided the year into twelve or so periods, this total wasn't congruent with the length of the solar year, and so a solution had to be found. The common fix was to add leap months in appropriate places, usually about seven or so, every 19 years, if operating on a 365-day solar calendar, something seen in both Egyptian and Chinese mixed lunisolar calendars. These sorts of calendars were complicated to keep track of 
And so there arose a dedicated class of astronomer bureaucrats whose responsibility was to advise the pharaoh or emperors of the correct days to observe the important rites and ceremonies. This wasn't the only way in which the year was divided, however. As we have seen, there are four astronomical division points in the year, two equinoxes and the two solstices. These points separate the astronomical seasons, with spring being the period from the vernal equinox to the summer solstice, the time from summer solstice to the autumnal equinox being summer, and so on. While this scientific division is pretty much ascendant now, in many times and places, in, and in many older civilizations, the year was divided into eight parts, with the calendric midpoints between the equinoxes and solstices also being important. In the Western religious or liturgical calendar, those are close to Candle Mass on February 2nd, Pentecost in early May, Transfiguration in mid-August, and All Saints and Souls Days in early November. In modern Western culture, these days have more or less been replaced by things such as Groundhog Day, May Day, Labor Day, and All Hallows' Eve. For many cultures in temperate regions, it is these dates between the equinox and solstice markers that more truly define the seasons. In Britain, the time around June 21st is less known as being the summer solstice and better known as Midsummer or Midsummer's Night, as immortalized by Shakespeare. For my American listeners, it's akin to thinking of summer as being the period between Memorial Day and Labor Day. In many cultures, winter begins on November 1st and ends on February 2nd. The Chinese New Year begins on February 5th in reckoning the beginning of spring. And in Celtic cultures, winter begins not in December, but rather with Samhain on November 1st. This association of the seasons with the midpoint dates is a more natural and to a degree is also more indicative of the weather to be expected of the season. With that word on calendars, I'd like to bring this episode to a close. Next week, we'll continue our supplemental series on ancient astronomical practices by looking at the Chinese, from the Mandate of Heaven to the Forbidden City. I don't know about you, but I find that I'm learning some really amazing things in my research about the practice of ancient astronomies in various cultures. Let me know if you're enjoying these episodes of, on mixing astronomy, anthropology, and archaeology. You can do that at our website, thescientificodyssey.typepad.com, or on our Facebook page. I'll also post a few images of various navigational tools that would have been used by our fictional navigator, as well as one or two of an armillary sphere, so you can see a model of the celestial sphere from that. Also, be sure to visit the website of the Blue Dot Sessions, whose compositions have accompanied us on our journey. They can be found at www. Dot sessions dot blue. As always, we'd like to ask that if you're enjoying the podcast and have got a few minutes, leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you happen to listen to the feed. It helps us show up more prominently in the various rankings around the web, which then allows more people to see the podcast. Also, if you've got friends who might be interested in learning something about how we came to understand the sky above us, let them know about this series and maybe arrange a time to go out and look at the sky. As I hope you realize by now, there's really no substitute to seeing the heavens for yourself and experiencing the sense of wonder and inquiry that invariably arises from placing oneself under the vault of the heavens. And once you've done that, we'll be here to offer additional insight and information to enrich your appreciation. So until next time, full sails on your journey. <laughs>